It was a quiet evening along the tree-lined street of Tailwood Place in Raleigh, North Carolina, on the 22nd of April, 2013. Residents of the neighbourhood were just settling in for the night, preparing dinner and watching television, when they heard a deafening scream echoing throughout the neighbourhood. Some of them glanced out their window, only to see a woman running down the neighbourhood, covered in blood. Jamie Han was born on the 25th of October, 1983, in Orangeburg, South Carolina. She attended Orangeburg Preparatory School, and then fell in love with the University of North Carolina and with Chapel Hill when she visited as a high school junior. She moved over and graduated from the university in 2006 with a degree in political science. At school, Jamie had served on the board of the Hope Centre at Pullen, and she was a very active member in the Young Alumni Association. After graduation, Jamie embarked on a career in politics, working as a fundraiser for Congressman David Pence and then working for Senator John Edwards' 2008 presidential campaign. Jamie exuded care and compassion. Her family said that she dedicated her life and her work to the idea that anybody was put on earth to care for those who need an extra measure of care. She strongly believed in justice, opportunity and fairness for all. Her family stated she had a gift for bringing us together, black and white, young and old, gay and straight. She challenged us to work together for a better world. It was while Jamie was working for the presidential campaign that she met her future husband, Nation Han, another up-and-coming political strategist. The couple settled down in Tailwood Place, a quaint residential street consisting of mostly single-family homes, just a 15-minute drive away from the centre of the city. It's a very desirable area for families, with a plethora of parks within just a stone's throw away, as well as the North Ridge Country Club. Nation recalled, Every day we were together, Jimmy would make me a better person. On the 18th of April 2009, the couple were married. Nation's best friend, 31-year-old Jonathan Broyhill, served as his best man at the wedding. Nation and Jonathan had grown up together in Lenore, North Carolina, and this friendship continued to grow into adulthood. They were an unlikely match. Even as a teen, Nation had a zeal for liberal politics. He graduated from UNC and moved quickly into Democratic Party circles. As for Jonathan, he grew up in a conservative family and graduated from Harris Chapel Christian Academy. He never attended college, and at the age of 23, he declared bankruptcy, owing more than $32,000. He was still living at his parents' home. He had run-up debts on seven credit cards and had taken out five loans, most of which were cash advance. Despite their differences, the Jew enjoyed spending time together. And when Nation married Jamie, Jonathan couldn't have been more pleased for them. He got on exceptionally well with Jamie as well. And the year that they were married, he moved from Lenore to Raleigh. The trio bonded over religion. In fact, it was a church where Nation and Jonathan met. And many summers were spent at church youth groups and at prayer meetings. Growing up in a conservative environment, Jonathan felt as though he couldn't truly be himself, a gay man. So when he moved to Raleigh and began to interact with Jamie and Nation's liberal friend circles, he felt empowered. The couple really took Jonathan under their wing, inviting him along on vacations and to date nights. 
Jamie and Nation were up and comers in the Democratic Party, and they were political strategists. Jamie was a prominent fundraiser for the state party, and she had even founded Blue Sky Strategies, a fundraising firm that focused on politics and non-profits. She knew that Jonathan was struggling financially, so she hired him at the company. Jonathan had a background in accounting, and Jamie needed help with the books. While Jamie and Jonathan worked together, Nation worked with the Coalition to Protect All North Carolina Families, which was a campaign opposed to the state constitutional amendment that limited marriage to a union between a man and a woman. He also worked as the director of engagement at New Kind, which was a media company that advocated against Amendment 1 and other issues. All three believed strongly in democratic values, and they all got on like a house on fire. Jimmy's Facebook cover was all three of them, smiles beaming from ear to ear. They also all shared common interests, beyond their jobs as democratic strategists, fundraisers, and campaigners. Jamie and Nation truly loved politics, and they were both genuinely good at it. Everything that they did in their job was for the people, and they refused to let cynicism of modern politics prevent them from believing the power of government could make a difference in the world. They were on top of the world, both in their personal lives and within their career fields. As for Jonathan, he was a constant fixture at the couple's home. He lived around six miles away, on Glasscock Street. But many neighbours of Jamie and Nation actually thought that Jonathan lived with them, due to the amount of time he was there. Most Monday nights, the group got together for a home-cooked meal at Jamie and Nation's home. It was around 5.30pm on the 22nd of April 2013 when a frantic 911 call came into Raleigh Police. The phone call was from Angela Cabe, who lived on Tailwood Place. Um, I had come home to take care of some business before I went to get my children, or a child, one of my children, from soccer practice and was um, standing outside and my son was inside. He had come home earlier that day, and I just heard silly noises, I thought. And my husband and I were standing outside about to leave and heard um, someone yelling, help. And I thought it was our son. He was 11 years old. He's a jokester. And I said, Kenny, what is he doing? And he said, that's, that's not Jax, Angie. So he ran down the driveway and... I mean, I saw his urgency, and my husband's not an urgent kind of person, but um, I ran down the, the driveway and looked across and saw um, Nation coming up Tillwood um, towards us. That's the first thing I saw. And then I saw Jamie um, up on the corner house, the one beside their house. She was up and beaten on that door. And... I didn't know what was going on, but uh, she turned around and it looked as though she was holding something that was bleeding. Um, maybe a dog. I didn't know what had happened. I mean, we were outside and didn't hear an accident or anything like that. And um, as she came closer, I realized that she wasn't holding anything. And so it was like shock. Okay, I got to run in and get the phone and make sure my son stays inside. Angela exclaimed to the operator that she had heard a woman screaming outside. She looked out of her window to see her neighbour, Jamie Han, stumble down the street. Jamie was covered in blood, and she fell to the ground just outside her home. Angela immediately ran outside and crouched down beside Jamie. She could immediately see that Jamie had been stabbed repeatedly. Her t-shirt was absolutely saturated in blood. She yelled at the 911 operator, 
Someone stabbed her and she's bleeding so badly. It was a lady that was running down the street and she's been stabbed and she's in the yard. Hey, we have um, uh, an emergency at the Kilbriar Drive. Okay, what's going on? I got him on the phone. What's going on? I got him on the phone. Ma'am, what's happening over there? I don't know. There's a lady bleeding terribly. Okay, how did she look like she's been shot? Okay. Has she been shot? Okay. Uh, Somebody uh, stabbed okay. her and she's bleeding so okay. badly. Okay, I'm getting the phone. Okay. Bill, I've got it. I've got 911 on the phone, ma'am. I'm getting Just before Jamie collapsed, Nation came running out of the home behind her. He crouched down beside his wife as Angela called for her husband to get some towels. They propped up Jamie's feet on a bag of leaves to keep her blood flowing to her head. And then they pressed towels against her stomach, hoping to stem the bleeding. Despite what appeared to be catastrophic injuries, Jamie was still conscious. Nation was repeatedly telling her that he loved her, and she replied that she loved him too. Nation then said to Jamie, We will celebrate many more anniversaries together. We're going to go back to the beach. We're going to go back to the beach. As Angela was on the phone to the 911 operator, she kept telling Jamie, who she'd never met before that day, to hang on and to keep breathing. But her breaths were getting shallower and shallower with each second that passed. Jamie then quickly muttered, I can't breathe. Jamie was fading quickly, and in a matter of minutes, a glazed look fell over her face. As police were rushing to the scene, the 911 operator asked Angela, whether anybody knew who had stabbed Jamie. Nation could be heard in the background, shouting, Jonathan Broyhill. He could then be heard yelling, He's my best friend. The person's still in the house and we need the police. As soon as okay. possible. Police responding to the phone call were directed to a location around a tenth of a mile away from the couple's home. Here, they found Jamie crumpled up on the ground, bleeding profusely from multiple stab wounds. There was a trail of blood leading all the way back to the couple's home. Jamie and Nation were rushed to Wake Med Hospital. Jamie had been the victim of a brutal and frenzied attack. She had been stabbed several times in the abdomen, but had also been stabbed in the cheek, neck, chest, back, forearms and hands. She'd been slashed and stabbed at least 14 times, with stab wounds penetrating her liver and right lung and severing arteries in her chest and forearm. Jamie was reported to be in critical condition due to the significant amount of blood she had lost. Nation had sustained cuts to his arms and hands, which had been inflicted as he attempted to fend off the knife man. Back at the crime scene, police followed the trail of blood, back to Jamie and Nation's home. Unaware as to whether Jonathan Broyhill was still inside or whether he had fled, Officer Ray Smith was one of the first officers on the scene. He and the other officers set up a perimeter outside the home. Minutes later, Broyhill emerged outside. He was covered in blood. I'm not screaming, but I'm talking as loudly as I possibly can. Um, I'm saying, turn around, walk back to the sound of my voice, do it now. Keep walking back to the sound of my voice, do it now. He he was walking slow, and obviously because he was walking backwards and there was the car there, it, it wasn't straight. It was sort of at, you know, it was kind of, like in, an, like in an angle, he just kind of slowly. When he got to the car, he froze. At that point, I, I, I moved from my position of the tree and I started walking closer to him, thinking, all right, this is about ready to be time to place handcuffs on him and secure him. Uh, as I'm moving towards him, that's when I start saying, I need you to prone down to go to the ground. I come out and I start approaching him when he stops at this blue BMW, the front. He, you know, he sits on the hood. I mean, sits on the front of the hood. Um, 
I give him maybe an order or two that he doesn't really respond to, uh, and within seconds is when he collapses. That's when he ground. collapses. Yes, sir. Officer Smith ordered Broyhill to stop. But seconds later, Broyhill collapsed to the ground. He had deep self-inflicted injuries to both wrists and a deep puncture wound to the stomach. The wound to the stomach was so deep that Officer Broyhill could see the tissue pulse with each beat of Broyhill's heart. He could see that his intestines were protruding from the wound. As paramedics moved Broyhill to the ambulance, Officer Smith entered the home. He'd been to countless crime scenes in his 10-year career, but he referred to the scene as one of the worst he had ever seen. There were large pools of blood on the kitchen floor. There was blood on the refrigerator, the walls, a baby gate, and leading outside. The blood was a mixture of Jamie's, Nations and Broyhill's. Broyhill was transported to Wake Med for the self-inflicted injuries. In one hospital room, Jamie was fighting for her life. In another, so was Broyhill. The following day, Nation was released from the hospital. He immediately spoke with investigators. Jamie was in no condition to speak. Nation detailed the events of the stabbing. On Monday evening, Nation had returned home after work. I walked in our front door through the entryway, and um, I was on the phone, and I had some packages on the, we had like a, I don't know how to describe it, like a little cat, not a cabinet, but a chest, like a cedar chest inside the door. So there were some packages on the cedar chest. So I started sort of flipping through those, and I was on the phone. I hung up, and I saw John was walking through the kitchen. Um, so I went over, gave him a hug, asked him how he's doing. He said, yeah, I'm doing okay. Uh, I asked him, are you going to stay um, with us tonight? Um, and he said he thought so. Um, it was around 5 p.m. and Jamie was sitting on the computer in her home office in the kitchen. Broyhill was in the kitchen as well. He had come over for dinner and to talk with Jamie about work. The two men briefly hugged before Nation went upstairs to change into his gym clothing. I was using the, the restroom and I heard Jamie scream. And I yelled out, what? Um, and I turned to leave the restroom and I yelled, what, again. Um, and she, she called my name. She screamed, Nation. Um, but she also screamed, John. Um, my immediate assumption was that something had happened with him. Uh, the way she was screaming his name, it just sounded like, uh, it, it just sounded like something, like he passed out or something. Um, so I started proceeding through the bedroom as quickly as I could, threw open the door. Um, she was still screaming, alternating her names, um, screaming mine as if sort of come, screaming his in a different way, um. I was um, I was halfway down the stairs, and I was yelling what as I ran, or what's happening. Or uh, I was halfway down the stairs, and she screamed out, he's trying to kill me. Nishan bolted down the stairs to find Jamie on the kitchen floor. There was blood seeping through her t-shirt and pouring down her face. Boyhill was standing above her, holding a bloody knife. Jamie screamed at her husband. He's trying to kill me. Nation ran over to defend his wife. He immediately turned and, and proceeded towards, towards me. I screamed out, what the fuck are you doing? I'm sorry. And he came towards me. He had the knife up. Or he pulled the knife up. And then he sliced it towards me. And my immediate reaction, as best I can remember, was to try to grab the, the blade or to grab towards it because it was coming towards me. Um, and we immediately started sort of wrestling. I was trying to get the blade from him. At the same time, I was hitting him sort of open face with, in the, in the palm, with the palm of my hand, screaming at him, what are you doing? 
and no response. Uh, I was also screaming at Jamie to get out of the house. Jamie was able to pull herself up off the floor and stumble outside, leaving a trail of blood behind her. She let out a guttural scream, catching the attention of several neighbours. Nation followed close behind, glancing back to see Broyhill just walking calmly down the hallway. I started looking for Jamie. I was no, I couldn't see her at the time. Um, I don't remember distinctly how, even how I proceeded out of the house, except I went out the side door and went, I think, down the driveway, um, screaming for help. The n- next time I have a very clear memory of her, um, I was screaming at someone to call nine one one, and there was a person walking towards me. Um, and I turned back to her, and she was clutching her side, and she had like a, a, a big wound in her side, or what looked like a big wound. Um, eventually, you know, I, I, I just don't, it was just chaotic. I was, uh, she, eventually she sat, she sat down in the, or collapsed or something in the yard of the Heralds, and I, my next clear memory is really just talking to her. Jimmy wasn't doing too well in the hospital, and she was reported to be in critical condition. There were, there were a couple of times where I was by myself in that room, and it was the loneliest, loneliest feeling, because I knew that Jamie was being operated on, and, you know, my hands were stitched, but I couldn't, I mean, I, there was nowhere to go, there was no one around, um, but periodically different people would come in, the chaplain, the, the surgical resident, nurses, um, I think they eventually gave me some sort of pain pills, I can't remember, or painkillers, I don't know when, sometime that later on. The community came together to show Jamie and Nation support on Tuesday night. They gathered for a prayer service at Raleigh's Pollen Memorial Baptist Church, and Nation was in attendance. Both he, Jamie and Roy Hill were active members of the church. A large bandage on Nation's arm was a chilling reminder of the tragedy that had unfolded just the night beforehand. Around 100 people gathered for the service. As Reverend Nancy Petty said, This is a very difficult thing, and Jamie is barely hanging on. Jamie's family released a statement which read, Jamie Han is fighting for her life. A nation, her husband, is by her side. Our families and her friends are devastated. We deeply appreciate the thoughts and expressions of love we have received. Jamie is a strong and courageous young woman and a bright light to us all. Pray for her. I felt like she was going to make it. Um, uh, The... The chaplain had walked in and said, you know, Jamie's still with us. And it was the happiest that I could ever remember feeling. And then the surgeon came in and said, she's still with us and she's she's exceeding expectations, but she's touch and go and the next 24 hours will tell the tale. Um, But I just never gave up hope. because we'd had a conversation, you know, because she'd gotten out of the house, because we had a conversation, I just believed, you know, and when I left her, I mean, we said, I love you, and it, while she was complaining about her breathing, she was with us. Um, and so, but finally the doctor told us that she wasn't, um, Jamie wasn't going to make it, and so we... Um, we were with with her in the in the hotel. I mean, in the hospital room, and, and sat there, and, and it was like a little bit before two a.m. I think. Jamie clung desperately for life until Wednesday morning, when she succumbed to her injuries at around one fifty a.m. Her family released a statement which read, "Jamie lost her struggle to live this morning. We just lost a beautiful and loving wife, daughter." and friend. We all lost a pure and brave spirit. They thanked the community for their outpouring of support, writing that they were inspired by how even strangers had rallied around Jamie, Nation and the family. 
They ended the statement with, It is our fervent hope that an even larger community will be inspired now by the way she lived her life. Their statement was followed by a gut-wrenching tweet from Nation, who had just lost the love of his life. He wrote, I have no idea what I'm going to do without Jamie. She was my centre, my rock and my soulmate. A visitation was held for Jamie on the Friday at Finladder Hall from 6pm until 8pm. The following day, Jamie's funeral was held at Pullen Memorial Baptist Church. Hundreds of her loved ones gathered for the poignant service, with many spilling outside. As they shuffled inside, they were greeted by an oversized picture of Jamie, smiling from the pulpit. Nation said to the group of mourners, Jamie dedicated her life to making a difference, and it is that dedication that has brought so many of us together tonight to pray for her, stand with her, and express our love for her. He described his late wife as a good and decent person, who saw wrongs and wanted to make them right. He then read a poem by Aeschylus that Jamie had loved. It was a poem quoted by Robert F. Kennedy on the night that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. It read in part, Even in our sleep, pain, which cannot forget, fails drop by drop upon the heart until, in our own despair, against our own will, comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. There were several other people who said a few words during the service, including former United States Senate candidate Ken Lewis, who said that Jamie wanted justice for everybody and wanted everyone to have opportunity. He compared her political philosophy to that of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Her friend Katie Mixon said, Keep reminding me to be more like Jamie, to dedicate myself to helping others, standing up for what is right, and seeing the good in all around me. Later that night, it was the Jefferson Jackson Dinner, which is the Democratic Party's biggest annual event. The dinner was dedicated to Jamie, and included a film tribute featuring photographs of her life. In the wake of the murder, those who knew Jamie, Nation and Broyhill were absolutely stumped. They had all seemed to get on like a house on fire, and people couldn't make sense of what had unfolded. A motivation would emerge in the immediate aftermath, however. Investigators quickly learned that Broyhill was being investigated for misuse of funds in Jamie's company. Sky Blue. In 2010, former Democratic U.S. Rep. Brad Miller had hired Sky Blue for fundraising help while he was seeking re-election. In 2012, however, Miller abandoned his plans to run for Congress. And as the campaign closed down, Broyhill was asked to send refunds to the big donors. It had become apparent that some things Broyhill said about the campaign finances were inconsistent with other information. The campaign's finance action caught the attention of the Federal Elections Committee around a year prior to the stabbings. They sent Miller campaign treasurer, John Wallace, a letter requesting some more information about documents that appeared to show that donors were receiving refunds in excess of what they paid. Five donors gave a combined $8,250 in the 2012 quarterly report, but documents showed that these five received $15,900 in refunds. Jamie had been made aware of the inconsistencies, and she was asked to delve into the issue. As Broyhill was under investigation for the misuse of funds, he informed Nation and Jamie that he had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Jamie and Nation were distraught. Despite the problems that had surfaced, 
Boyhill was still a dear friend to them. They knew that he had been suffering with his health for quite some time. Broyhill had been very vocal about having multiple sclerosis, a condition that can affect the brain and spinal cord, leading to a plethora of symptoms. Broyhill explained that he was going through an aggressive form of medication to combat the symptoms of the condition, as a way to support his friend in March of 2013. Nation participated in a walk to benefit MS research. Early the next month, Nation and Jamie allowed Broyhill to stay with them for several days, after he told them that he had gotten gallbladder surgery. The couple were more than content to care for Broyhill. It was during this stay that he informed them that his doctor had seen evidence of pancreatic cancer. Jamie and Nation rallied around Broyhill. Just the week before they were stabbed, they attended church where they asked the reverend to pray for him. Nation recalled, Jamie was real torn up, as was I. They knew that a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer often brought a poor prognosis, even when diagnosed early. Nation commented, It's like a killer. It's like a death sentence. Nation recalled a conversation he had with Broyhill shortly before the stabbings. Uh, he had, John had walked out on the beach. Um, I was sitting by himself staring out at the ocean, so I walked out um, and asked him if he wanted to walk up and down the beach, and we did, and we had a conversation. I just asked him, you know, how are you really doing? How are you feeling? Um, and he just shared that, you know, he felt like the next few months were going to be rough, um, but that he would come out on the other side okay. Um, that he really appreciated how much we were supporting him and that, um, you know, things would be, would work out. Um, and he seemed, uh, you know, relatively at peace. Cause we, I mean, again, we were worried about him knowing this procedure was coming up at Duke and knowing that he, or assuming that he had uh, pancreatic cancer and, and MS. Uh, but he seemed relatively at peace uh, when we were on at walking. Um, so. Jamie had been wanting to speak with Broyhill for a while about the inconsistencies in the finances but she knew that he was going through an incredibly difficult time. He really wasn't well at all, and now he had been diagnosed with cancer. Jamie made herself available at all hours for Broyhill, driving him to and from doctor appointments and waiting outside in the car. She thought that it was the least she could do for her friend. A couple of days before the stabbing, Royhill had asked Jamie and Nation to come with him to his doctor's appointment for cancer. He asked if he could stay overnight on the Monday, and then they drive him early Tuesday morning. Of course they agreed. After Jamie and Nation were stabbed, investigators learned that no such doctor appointment existed. In fact, Royhill didn't even have cancer nor did he have multiple sclerosis, or have his gallbladder removed. For years he had been weaving a web of lies, and both Jamie and Nation had fallen hook, line and sinker. Towards the end of April, Royhill was appointed Joseph Arbor as his public defender. He'd remained in hospital for around a week. He was wheeled into court to be formally charged with murder and assault with a deadly weapon, with intent to kill. The charges meant that if convicted, Broyhill could be looking at a sentence of life in prison or even death. As the charges were filed, Broyhill's mother, Kay, released a statement which read, Our family is still reeling from the shock of what happened last Monday. Our hearts are broken for the Kirk Han families, and we pray God will bring his peace and comfort to them in their grieving. John has always had a sweet, gentle nature and been loved by all who knows him. We will continue to love him and support him in any way we can. It would then be revealed that Broyhill had actually made a full confession to the attack on Jamie and Nation. As Broyhill was transported to hospital, suffering from self-inflicted injuries, 
He told both police and medical personnel that he wanted to take his own life. He began to cry. After he was treated at the hospital, he admitted that before driving over to Jamie and Nation's home, he grabbed a knife from his apartment. He said that he had purchased the knife around two or three weeks earlier and had intended on using it to take his own life. As he said, the wheels had begun to come off with his life. When you say a down day and you weren't thinking clearly, is it just to hurt yourself? Is it to hurt? It was just, no, it was just to hurt myself. Okay. Do you think this was brought on by this money situation or? To be honest with you, sir. Right. I've honestly given that a lot of thought. Mm Mm-hmm. And if it was just that, I would have faced it and I would have faced the consequences. And I would never in a million years have ever hurt Jamie over that. I honestly feel like I would have literally just faced it and dealt with it without hurting her. Okay. But this depression and your thinking of hurting yourself, is that coming about because of the money situation? No, I don't think so. Because no. eventually you know that's coming. To, that's going to have to come to light. Yeah. And that's coming and, soon. And, we, and I had this attitude when he did, it did. Mm-hmm. And I was going to deal with it. And I would have never hurt anyone over it. Okay, so where is this depression and this thought of hurting yourself coming from? I've had bouts with it for a while. I spoke with a psychiatrist here yesterday. Okay. Um, Any other attempts in the past to ever hurt yourself? No, I mean, I've thought about it okay. a lot. I mean, there's some days that's all I think about. During the interrogation, Broyhill stated, I was having a darn day. I wanted to hurt myself. I've had thoughts for a while and spoke with a psychologist. I have some days, that's all I think about. He said that when he went to Jamie and Nation's home that evening, it was to have dinner, chat about work and then for them to drive him to his alleged doctor appointment. Investigators had established that Broyhill had lied about having cancer. They asked him, why didn't you tell them the truth? He replied, that's a good question. They would have been upset, but over time they would have accepted it. Time heals everything. Is it because of attention? I mean... I don't need the... The thing is, is I don't need the attention because I have a lot of wonderful friends. Right. And that's the thing that greatly concerned me is I didn't need it. Right. Because... Well, did you like the attention, or...? Not really, no. I didn't. Okay. Um... But... I'm, I'm just... I don't know what caused me to... tell people that one clearly it wasn't true. Right. Okay. That's... So now here. You're exactly right. It's... It wasn't for the attention. Okay. At all. An investigator then asked Broyhill what he remembered about stabbing Jamie. Okay. No, I, I do. I, uh, okay. I was in a because I, I've, been, I've been laying here and I remember mm-hmm. shards of things. Okay. What are you remembering now? The only thing I remember is I just remember... Stabbing her in the back. Where first or? First, yeah. Where is she at in relation to you? She's. I'm walking behind her. Okay, but. I, I remember her looking at me and screaming. Mm-hmm. And I remember her getting up. Broyhill recollected that he could remember walking up behind Jamie as she sat on a stool in her kitchen. He raised the eight-inch knife above his head and then stabbed Jamie in the back. He stated, She turned to look and screamed. Other than this, he said he remembered very little about the attack. 
With the confession, investigators began looking into the potential motivation, the misuse of funds. The announced embezzlement was the most likely catalyst behind the murder of Jamie. They had seized all of Broyhill's bank records, and according to the warrant, as this investigation has progressed, it has been determined that these financial documents may provide a motive for this murder and contain evidence pertaining to the suspected embezzlement. Broyhill's bank records indicated that he had in fact been using his employment with Sky Blue Strategies to embezzle funds from Miller's political campaign. When Broyhill admitted to the murder, he also admitted to the embezzlement. He said that on the morning of the attack, Jamie had left him a voicemail, which said, Hey there, it's me. Maybe four-ish at the end of the business day, and time to get to the bank. Bring bank stuff and your mailbox key. Call me when you get a chance. Jamie had wanted Broyhill and her to sit down and have a conversation about the financial issues. When Broyhill arrived, Jamie started talking to him about paying off various debts. It was all too apparent to Broyhill that the jig was up, and Jamie was becoming aware of just what exactly he was doing. Funneling money into his own account. As the investigation continued, a foundation was established in Jamie's name. The Jamie Kirk Han Foundation. The foundation's executive director, Alexis Trost, said, We are working on building a cadre of leaders, an army of Jamies across the triangle and across the state. The foundation truly embraces ideas and issues that were close to Jamie's heart, including poverty, hunger, and developing new leaders that have the potential to change the community. Alexis stated, She believed deeply that if we had more leaders who led with love, who listened, who were humble, and who took action, then North Carolina would be a better place. They planned on honouring and remembering Jamie for her upcoming 30th birthday. A birthday party was scheduled for Cam Raleigh, and all of the proceeds were going to the foundation. In addition to the party, there was a day of service and a concert. The Jamie Kirk Han Foundation had partnered with the Interfaith Food Shuttle to give back to the community, and they also worked closely with many homeless charities. It was a fitting way to celebrate the life of somebody who dedicated so much time to helping others. The murder trial was scheduled for March of 2015 after Broyhill pleaded not guilty to all of the charges against him. By the 3rd of March, the jury were seated and the trial was ready to begin. All of Jamie's loved ones crowded the courtroom. The murder case was not a classic whodunit. Broyhill had already made a full confession. The crux of the case was going to be whether the jury believed that the murder was premeditated. During opening statements, Assistant District Attorney Doug Fawcett put forward their theory that Jamie had been stabbed to death by Broyhill simply because she had called him out after she discovered that he had stolen a whopping $46,000. The defendant, someone Jamie considered a dear friend, someone Jamie hired to work for her at Sky Blue, The defendant on April 22nd, 2013, relentlessly attacked Jamie with an eight inch bladed chef's knife while they were meeting at her house to discuss some unresolved financial issues involving a particular sky blue client. He went on to detail how Broyhill had weaved a web of lies for years. Lies about who he was, where he had gotten money from, and even lies about illnesses and health issues that he had fabricated as a means to get sympathy. These fabrications had come as Broyhill was being investigated for the financial problems in Jamie's business. So the evidence would show that as each medical issue materialized, Jamie would step back from pressing the defendant to meet with her, transfer these materials, and 
try to resolve these outstanding Brad Miller wind down issues and instead would turn her attention, her sympathy and efforts to helping her friend get through these awful health issues to include driving him to the doctor and waiting. Roy Hill had admitted to bringing the knife to Jamie and Nation's home that evening. But the defence claimed that his plan was to kill himself, not Jamie or Nation. Defence attorney Caroline Elliott said, John went over to the Hans house that day. John never went over to the Hans house that day, intending to kill Jamie Hahn. The facts will show that John never went over to the Hans house that day, intending to injure Nation Hahn. The facts will show that the only person John planned on hurting that day was himself. There was one motive that drove John to do what he did that night. Suicide. She said that Roy Hill had felt depressed and isolated and had been shunned by his family and much of his hometown for being gay. Defence Elliot said to the jury, The evidence is going to show a picture of a tormented soul that had become so depressed and so despondent that he was ready to take his own life. The act of a man overwhelmed by life. Several witnesses testified on the first day of the trial, including Angela, the neighbour who had called 911, and Officer Roy Smith, one of the first responders to the crime scene. He said that as he rode with Broyhill to the hospital, he never made any mention of attacking Nation or Jamie, only that he wanted to take his own life. He testified, He made statements to emergency medical services, stating that he wanted to die. Various other people, including Stacey Johnson, a crime scene analyst, described how blood from the home led over to Angela's front yard, where Jamie had collapsed. The courtroom fell silent as Nation took to the witness stand. He described the moment he found his wife bleeding profusely on the kitchen floor, telling the jury... I was halfway down the stairs, and she screamed out, He's trying to kill me. There was blood on the floor, and I could see Jamie's leg stick out. He described the moment he crouched down beside Jamie as she bled on her neighbor's yard. Telling her that I loved her. You know, we would say, we said it back and forth, you know, promising her that we would have a lot more anniversaries. I, I told her we'd go back to the beach as soon as she was better. Um... And we just had that kind of conversation. I I asked her at one point, I said, uh, I remember asking something to the effect of, why did he do this? Or what what happened? And because I knew they were going to look at bank books. And I said, did he take Brad's money? Or what happened? And she she didn't really respond to that. I mean, at that point, um, the uh, who I found out later was Bill Harrell, I think, walked me away and was tending to my hands, which is when I first realized that my hands had been damaged. Um, Someone give you a towel or something there? They gave, yeah. Before I, the EMS went. I think so. Um, and my last real clear memory from just standing there was, you know, having my towel bandaged and then watching the EMS uh, take Jamie away. Um, she was, she'd been complaining about her breathing when I was over there, and I assumed, I thought she was going to have an asthma attack. Um because she had really bad asthma. So my assumption was that she was having an asthma attack or that that was impacting her breathing. Um, so I remember I, I remember telling Julie or someone, you know, she has asthma, she has asthma, she has asthma. Um, and that was, a, for whatever reason, was a real concern to me. That was sticking with me. He went on to speak about the toll Broyhill's phony cancer diagnosis had on himself and his wife. He told the jury, I remember through her tears she turned to me and said, Don't you think we should have a baby? Jamie told Nation that she wanted their child to know all of their friends, and she worried that Broyhill might not be around for much longer. Both she and Nation were completely unaware that it was Jamie that wouldn't be around for much longer. It was just 15 days after this conversation that Jamie was stabbed to death. Nation hadn't become aware of all the lies that Broyhill had told until after the murder. He had lied about having multiple sclerosis, 
brain lesions, gallbladder surgery and pancreatic cancer. He'd also lied about attending mortuary school, getting a car loan for a Volvo and having a job at Lab Corpse. He revealed during trial that at the time of the attack, neither he nor Jamie were aware that Broyhill had stolen $46,000. He said that they thought that it was around $500 or $600 that were unaccounted for, and that Jamie and Broyhill had made plans to go over the bank books and chat about it. He told the jury that when Jamie was in the hospital, he believed that she was going to make it. He stated, I just never gave up hope. I just believed because I said I loved her. We had a conversation. After the attack, Nation never returned to the home he had shared with his wife. What was once a home filled with love now only bore reminders of the tragedy that had cost his wife her life and cost him his best friend. In the immediate aftermath, he said he felt a sensation of extreme loneliness. After Nation stepped down from the witness stand, the jury would hear from Detective Seek Morse, who detailed some internet searches that Broyhill had made. The night before the attack, he had researched countries that he could get into without a passport. The implication from the prosecution was that Broyhill was thinking about his getaway because he was planning on doing something that would require him to flee the country. On the 21st of April, he had booked a one-way ticket using Nation's credit card for a flight from Charlotte to Las Vegas. He cancelled this ticket just a couple of hours later and then left his apartment to go to Jamie and Nation's home. His internet search history also showed that in early April, he had been doing some Google searches on medical conditions that he claimed to have. Prosecutors believe that he had concocted these illnesses simply to deflect Jamie and Nation. The prosecution rested, and it was now time for the defence to present their case. They called on Dr. Badri Hamra, Broyhill's psychiatrist, who testified that he had been prescribed medication for anxiety, depression and psychosis. She told the jury that Broyhill had once told her that he had been sexually abused as a child and suffered from low self-esteem and sexual identity. Broyhill's mother then testified about their strained relationship that developed between herself and her son following her divorce from his father. Prior to Broyhill's arrest, the last time he had seen his mother was in Christmas of 2013. During closing arguments, defence attorney Joseph Arbour didn't mince his words. He admitted that his client had taken Jamie's life and attacked Nation in an act of wild violence. He stated, Nation and Jamie were victims of a tragedy. There's no doubt about it. But just because they were victims, that doesn't mean it was premeditated. This isn't somebody who just has a specific intent to stab somebody. This guy's gone wild. He's just lashing out. He said that life sometimes becomes too hard to bear for people. And that day, Broyhill finally had enough of life. The prosecution countered this, painting Broyhill as a cold-blooded killer who should be punished as such. Assistant District Attorney Doug Fawcett said, Fact-finding is not at play here. The identity of Jamie Han's killer is clear. He sits just 20 feet away. This jury has the advantage to know with certainty that Jonathan Broyhill fatally stabbed Jamie Han and then tried to do the same to Nation. The crux of the case was truly whether the jury believed that Broyhill had gone to Jamie and Nation's home that evening to attack, or whether he had simply planned on taking his own life instead. The prosecution and defence had offered polarising narratives, and the jury could convict him on either first-degree murder or second-degree murder. The jury ultimately sided with the prosecution. After deliberating for less than two hours, they found Jonathan Broyhill 
guilty of first-degree murder. As the verdict was read aloud, applause erupted in the courtroom. Outside, Jamie's father, Chris Kirk, said that the family were gratified by the verdict. We know that difficult times still lie ahead. We will never be able to fill the hole left in our lives by the death of Jamie. We would give all that we have to have Jamie back with us, to see her grow older and to become a mother and to witness the difference she could have made in the world. Jamie's death is not just a loss of us, the immediate family, it's a loss for the present and the future, and there are so many who have been robbed so much. The children Jamie and Nation would have parented, the lives she would have changed for the better, especially here in the Raleigh community, the causes that she would have worked for, and the strangers who would have been greeted by her essential kindness, laughter, and smile. In the years ahead, we will all strive to keep that smile, her service, and her spirit alive through the wonderful work of the Jamie Kirk Hahn Foundation headquartered here in Raleigh. Thank you all for being here. During the sentencing phase, Jamie's loved ones spoke of the heartbreak the crime had on them. Nation said that he carried Jamie's wedding band in a necklace, which includes the words, I love you to the moon. He described his late wife as the most wonderful person I have ever known. He said that Jamie had fought hard for her life before turning to Broy Hill and staring. She tried to give that same strength, that same compassion, to John Broy Hill because she loved him too. I would give anything, 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 anything to hold her in my arms, to see her make this, what I refer to as a frog face when she was getting ready to kiss me, to kiss her, to hold her, to tell her I love her. I can't. But I hope that everyone will do what I try to do every day, which is take some of her with us. Some of her essential goodness. Some of her love for others, her care, her concern, her compassion. Because we never really die as long as there are people who love us, who carry our example forward. And all of us who knew Jamie know that that spirit will carry forward with all of us. John, you tried, you killed her. You tried to kill me. But you can't kill her spirit. You can't kill what it was that made her so special. Her spirit out that night. And you couldn't stop her love for you in the future life. Thank you. His poignant statement was followed by Jamie's parents, who detailed their horror upon learning that Jamie had been attacked by somebody they believed was her friend. At one point, the family had essentially considered Broy Hill family. Her father, Chris, stared directly at Broyhill and said, John, you gave Jamie a death sentence. You gave us all a life sentence. And now, you can share in that sentence, John. Her stepmother, Teresa Kirk, said that when Jamie died, a part of her died as well. Her mother, Jamie Kirk, said that so much had been stolen from both of them and Jamie the dreams of grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Jonathan Broyhill was sentenced to life in prison and an additional 19 to 25 years for additional charges. He appealed his conviction in April of 2017, arguing that testimony from a psychiatrist should have been allowed to be presented during trial. His appeal was denied. Jamie Hamm was described by everybody who knew her as a giver, a political strategist who loved to bring people together. This included Jonathan Broyhill. Jamie had opened up her heart and her home to a pathological liar who not only stole money from her, but stole her life as well. 
Today, Jamie's legacy lives on with the Jamie Kerr Khan Foundation, which continues to provide food, and therefore life, to those in need. Well, besties, that is it for this episode of Morbidology. As always, thank you so, so much for listening. I'd also like to say a big, huge thank you to my lovely new Patreon supporter, Katie. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon, the link is in the show notes. You can join for as little as just $1 a month, and there are absolutely no obligations. You can cancel any time. In exchange for 